Welcome everyone. It's such a pleasure to have you here for the fifth session in the Minister of Agriculture's webinar series, Labor Success Stories. I'm Rachel Shivery, and I'm the Director of Regional Services with the Agriculture Food and Operations Branch of the Department of Agriculture. I will be your moderator for today's session. I'd like to kick off today's session with a few words from our Minister, Minister Greg Moreau. Welcome to today's session on Labor Success Stories. As spring approaches, accessing and retaining workers is top of mind for all producers. And whether these workers are students, local community members, temporary foreign workers, or newcomers to our province, the ability to attract and keep employees is crucial to running a successful farm operation. Today we'll hear from producers who have made human resource planning a top priority. Jenny Newcomb of Cornwallis Farms Limited will share her experiences of attracting and retaining labor to her family's mixed farm in the Annapolis Valley. As well as being an active farmer, Jenny is a member of the Labor Committee for the Nova Scotia Federation of Agriculture. Janice Lutz of Lutz Far Family Farms was recognized as an Employer of the Year through the 2019 Minister's Awards for Excellence. Together with her husband Larry and her extended family, she operates a peach and apple orchard in Rockland, Nova Scotia. She also manages the human resource activities at the farm. We're also grateful to have Mary Jo McKay, Manager External Relations for the Nova Scotia Office of Immigration, join us today. Mary Jo helps employers understand the pathways to employing immigrant workers. Today's webinar is moderated by Rachel Chevery, the Nova Scotia Department of Agriculture's Director of Regional Services. For the past two years, Rachel has been at the forefront of helping producers navigate the public health guidelines associated with bringing temporary foreign workers to Nova Scotia. At today's webinar, she'll share insights on the guidelines for the season ahead. I'd like to thank our sponsors for the webinar series, Farm Credit Canada, the Nova Scotia Farm Loan Board, and TELUS Agriculture for their support of today's important discussion. I look forward to continuing the dialogue on accessing skilled labour and labour-saving technologies at our live conference November 3rd and 4th at the Halifax Trade and Convention Centre. I hope everyone enjoys today's event and I look forward to seeing you in November. Thank you, Minister. Our series sponsors, as you mentioned, are Farm Credit Canada, the Nova Scotia Farm Loan Board, and TELUS Agriculture. We now have a few videos from each of our sponsors to watch. Food keeps our country going, and so do you. If you grow it, produce it, pack it, or move it, you're a key to our future, and we're behind you every step of the way. We're FCC, the only lender 100% invested in Canadian agriculture and food, serving diverse people, projects, and passions with financing and knowledge. If you're behind Canadian food, we're behind you. FCC. Dream. Grow. Thrive. My name is Alphonse Vermeulen. My wife and I farm 50 dairy cows on a robot in Urbania, Nova Scotia. We, we actually got married in 2014 and bought the farm in 2014. And originally we owned a tie stall in Princeport um, and it was just January of 2020 that we moved to this site in Urbania. Uh, we've been working with the farm loan board since the beginning when we first bought the farm in Princeport. The Farm Loan Board was uh, more flexible with the challenges we were facing trying to enter the industry. They helped us actually to do this site switch. Um, they provided us with a loan that helped us to retrofit the barn that we're standing in right now. That was a tremendous, tremendous help. It was a big step for us to move from the tie stall to the milking facility that we have here. So with the loan board, uh, we do, we're, we're character lenders and we do like to develop relationships with our clients. Um, and what that means is through the years we get to see how people are progressing and how they're growing. Uh, we get to see their weaknesses as well as their strengths. Uh, we do look at, uh, we, we review their financials uh, yearly and we like to see where we can uh, make that better and make them stronger. So we're really a complement to the other lending options. You know, we, we say that we don't compete with banks or, or other lending agencies. What we really want to do is provide 
um, a solution for farmers that is different than what's being offered commercially. Really diving down on the business plan, working with them to make sure that they have a partnership um, with other programs or granting opportunities um, is really what we're focused on. They understood a lot of things that even we didn't understand and, and uh, it really helped us navigate some, some tough times when you're trying to get into the industry. Agriculture fuels the world. But as our food needs evolve, so will our need for information. We're making a commitment to everyone. From seed growers to grocers. To leverage the power of connection and technology. To build trust. To link systems together and to use resources and information in new ways. We want to build something stronger for everyone. To share the responsibility by cultivating partnerships that drive the industry forward and harvesting ideas as transformative as the first horse-drawn plow. Because we believe in creating better food outcomes. Thank you so much to our series sponsors for their support. Before we move on to the session, I'd like to remind folks that there are four more sessions remaining in this series. All are free and please visit perennia.ca to register. I also wanted to take a moment to mention that the Minister's Conference for Agriculture will be held in person on November 3rd and 4th at the Halifax Convention Centre. Registration is also open now for this event. So now on to our session. For today's session, we have three panelists to discuss different labour streams that an employer might utilise. After our panelists have completed each of their presentations, we'll then open up for a Q&A session. And I will be saving about 10 minutes at the end of the webinar for me to go through the new 2022 guidance information that was sent out to employers of temporary foreign workers last week. First off, we have Geneve Newcomb from Cornwallis Farms in the Annapolis Valley. Geneve is gonna share her screen and talk to us about their success in attracting and retaining local labor on their farm operation. So Geneve, I'll hand it over to you. You just need to unmute there, Geneve. Can you unmute yourself, Geneve? There we go. And it, now can you hear? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, my screen's done funny things here, which didn't happen in the practice. Can you see the slide presentation? We can't yet, no. Okay. I think it's come up on your end instead of my end. And I can't seem to minimize the screen to do the share, but the second. Now we can get our text. Oh, there we go. Is it up full screen there or just part way? There we go. Now it's full screen. So if you hit it. Okay. Please. Sorry about that. 
Uh, no worries. Hopefully soon we'll be back in person and we can <laughs> do things a little easier. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share our experiences about local labour. And I'd like to begin by giving you just a brief description and overview of our farm. Um, on our farm, we grow broiler chickens. Uh, we grow approximately 1.6 million kgs per year. Uh, we also have a dairy operation where currently we're milking about 75 cows. And we have 24,000 laying hens um, and grow our own pullets. So we're gathering about 23,000 or more eggs a day. In addition to the livestock, we grow field crops. Uh, we grow approximately 2,000 acres. Um, our main crops are corn, wheat, soybeans, and forages. And all these crops are used on farm as we have an on-farm feed mill to provide the needs of um, all our dairy and poultry. So that's just a little bit about the background of our farm. Uh, <clears throat> we are a family farm. In this photo, you can see uh, my son, David, my husband, Craig, and my brother-in-law, Brian, uh, they all work full-time on the farm. In addition, I'm part-time, although some days it feels like full-time, depending on what's going on. And my nephew, Evan, who'll be Brian's son, um, he's part-time right now, but as he's graduating soon with uh, his heavy mechanics, he'll be joining the operation full-time this summer as well. So in addition to the five family members, uh, we currently have five full-time employees, uh, one who's been with us for 21 years now, and they work primarily in the dairy operation and manage the herd. Um, one of our employees has been with us 14 years. Um, he started as a summer student and then joined us full-time. He did leave us for a few years to explore another opportunity, but has come back. So he's had 14 years in total with us now and manages much of our poultry. Uh, we have another individual that's been with us 13 years that looks after the shop and the equipment, an equipment operator that's been here for nine years. And then our most junior employee has been here three years and uh, he started as a summer student and now works as a laborer on the farm. In addition, we also have high school students. Uh, currently we have three high school students that rotate days to gather the eggs after school. And occasionally we will often hire a summer student as well. So why do we think we've had uh, good luck with employees? Um, part of it, I think, is we know we have to have an understanding of expectations. The employees need to know uh, what expectations we have of them. And in return, they have to have a good expectation of what we want as well. Uh, we've accomplished this through the development of an employee manual. And our manual outlines uh, several items, including what their wages are, uh, when overtime hours kick in, and bonuses that they might be eligible for. Um, we also offer uh, raises each year uh, based on number of years employed and increase in responsibilities. As well, we'll add a cost of living allowance to employees each year. Uh, they're informed of payroll procedure, how their timesheets are to be completed, when they should be turned in. Uh, we offer paid sick days. So currently we offer 10 paid sick days per employee each year. And I, I know some people think that's quite a bit, but we've done that a number of years and very few employees ever max them out. They're, they're very responsible that way. Um, we talk about vacation time and holidays. Uh, we do offer some of the statutory holidays. Um, as a livestock operation, of course, everybody can't have every holiday off. So we work at that. If you're working that holiday, then you can take another day off the next week or the week before in lieu of. Uh, we offer an RSP matching program for our employees uh, based on their number of years here. Uh, we've developed farm policies around health and safety, um, around smoking and around animal care. And we also do go over an orientation checklist when any new employee starts. Um, I think the another thing that helps us with our success is being accessible to employees. Um, each morning, all the employees gather at the workshop to set out the expectations for the day. As things get busier, um, 
Sometimes we'll just meet on Monday mornings, but again, there's always that weekly meeting that lets everybody know what the plans are for the week, what the goals are to be accomplished, and what your responsibilities are. Uh, we'd like to think we encourage an atmosphere of growth. Uh, we um, provide training opportunities uh, for employees. We give them the opportunity to attend conferences that may be of interest to them. Um, as they show interest in learning more, we'll give them more responsibilities. Um, you know, they may start off by managing one barn, and if they're successful in that, we can add more barns to it. Um, we like to promote the idea that there's always something to strive for, because if employees feel there's nowhere for them to go, then they're likely going to go somewhere else. And I think it's fairly self-explanatory, but we like to lead by example. There's no job that we ask employees to do that we wouldn't do ourselves or that we don't do side by side along with them. And we value work-life integration. Uh, some people like to refer to it as work-life balance. Uh, there's not always a balance. Sometimes work is more uh, than the time off, but we do appreciate that there is a work-life integration that we need to look at their work and their career and how they can advance there, understand that they have home and family life, that they have opportunities to be involved with the community and connect with it, and that they look after their own health and well-being. And what can we do to help them achieve this? So I mentioned before, if there's a holiday and they're expected to work that day, then we ensure they have another day off in lieu of. I think for our employees, it's been really important that they know their schedule they know what their regular weekends are and their nights for night checks. So they do that in a rotation and they know it a month in advance. And also allowing time that if they have a family event they want to attend, a wedding, perhaps a child's conference, that that time off is given in lieu. And we have two employees, uh, one being our son, David, another employee that are both involved with the local fire department. Um, so we feel that's important. We want the fire department there to protect us if needed. So if there's a fire call during the workday, that's time off with pay to attend that fire to help a neighbor. So we feel that's important as well. Uh, we have busy schedules like everybody else and especially during uh, planting and harvesting time, things can be very busy. Uh, the first six weeks of planting, uh, all employees know that they're expected to be around and that they may be working several weekends during that time and evenings. For harvest and the remainder of the schedule, we each spring hold a scheduling meeting, and this is a photo of that there. We'll often bring in pizza or subs and beverages for them to enjoy as we plan out the schedule. Um, so they know which weekends they're gonna be on during the summer. Some they may just be on call um, and some they'll have off, but they'll know for making their own plans for vacation and time away. Uh, what our expectations are. So that's really just sort of a brief overview of, uh, of what we do. Um, I think we've probably had some good luck involved in hiring the right employees, but these tips and having these expectations outlined, I think have helped us to keep the good ones. You know, we understand as we develop this and get into human resources, that we're just not competing with other farms and the agricultural industry for good employees but there's uh, the Michelins and the Hostess plants and the other places around that we're in competition with too to gain and maintain these local workers. All right, thank you very much, Geneve. Uh, so now I'm gonna ask Janice Lutz to start sharing her screen. Um, Janice is from Lutz Family Farms in Rockland, Nova Scotia. And Janice will be talking to us about their success in navigating the seasonal agriculture worker program to bring temporary foreign workers in to work on their farm. I'll hand it over to you, Janice. And you're just muted, so I'll remind you to unmute. Unmute there. So thank you. Sorry about that. Hi there, everyone. And uh, it's great to. Aha, see you. Um, it's great to be here as part of the uh, 2022 Ministers Conference for Agriculture. Uh, I'm Janice, as you know, and I'm just going to sort of talk to you about Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program, SOP. And um, in contrast to Geneve, where they're looking after uh, animals, 
and uh, have a 365 day operation. Um, apple producers and horticulture producers have more of a seasonal operation. So um, the retention of employees uh, that we're competing against full-time employers most of the time. So I will um, tell you a little bit about our farm and, and that'll set the stage for how we got into foreign workers. So I was going to move that. There we go. Um, so we are an apple and peach producer. We're fifth generation farmers on this land, but first generation commercial tree fruit producers until we kind of came back to the farm and made it our own. It was a mixed operation supporting a family, but not real commercial operation. Larry and I both worked off of the farm uh, full time. Uh, we had our own careers while we built the farm up and uh, we both retired off farm 2017 and then 2019 for me. So in 1989, a few years after we were married, we came here and we started planting our first trees and they were semi-dwarf apple trees. And a decade later, we bought our first new piece of equipment and I'm happy to say we still have it. It's operating well. Uh, and that same year, so over those 10 years, we had accumulated 50 acres of, of uh, apple trees, of orchard. Um, five years later, we hired our first two SOP, seasonal agriculture workers uh, for our harvest. And fast forward to 2022, we now have 135 acres of apples and peaches, plus our nursery, because we do grow our own trees and they're all high density and slender spindle orchard. So what is the Seasonal Agriculture Worker Program? I'm just gonna give you a brief understanding of it. Um, there are federal agreements between the government of Canada and select Caribbean countries and the government of Mexico. Um, involved in that program, there are housing standards uh, inspected regionally, um, and I think there's a, a move to get a federal standard, but there are regional standards and inspections. Service Canada is involved. They oversee the program uh, from the government, and they perform integrity service audits. So uh, we are held to account. Um, we do regular payroll deductions like any other employee. Um, there's oversight of the program by local agents from the home country. So in Nova Scotia, there's a Jamaican liaison. He is there to uh, respond to employers and employees should any questions or concerns arise. Um, the workers pay into medical insurance. So uh, that's a cost shared program run through their government and the liaison service. Um, and of course, all farms have um, our own health and safety programs, and we are required to be um, part of the workers' compensation. And uh, each employer and employee uh, signs a contract, an agreement between the employer and the employee, so that all the expectations are understood. And, um, and of course, we must advertise first on the Canadian job market, because being Canadian, the first priority is to employ uh, and keep Canadians working. And why did we choose to hire uh, seasonal agricultural workers? Well, horticulture farms are the primary employers of SOP workers because it is so seasonal and because the work on a fruit and vegetable farm is very labor intensive. So in our situation, on the early years of our farm, while Larry and I were both not here a lot of the time, uh, production help was intermittent. It was weekends, family, friends, neighbors. Um, when it came time to harvest, it was, uh, it was local, it was sometimes part-time, mostly weekends, and the people helping us changed every year. It really depended on who was looking for work and available at that time. As I said, Larry and I both worked off the farm and we needed help during the day to get things done because we realized uh, that our farm was just not producing anywhere near its potential. It had so much more potential and we had so many more uh, ambitions for it. So when we hired the two SOP employees to help with harvest, it was a relief. You can't imagine we were at work and we we're like, apples are getting picked and we're not there. We're not cramming it in on a weekend. It was wonderful. And after that, we started hiring employees in the spring and summer to help us as well. And uh, we did that until this year. We will be employing 20 workers this year. And, and it is because we've had that reliable returning uh, trained workforce that we've been able to grow and expand from struggling to get to 50 to, you know, the, the 135 right now. 
Uh, some of the advantages, I think, of hiring um, seasonal agricultural workers, um, the advantages for the farm is it just gave us the confidence. We were plateaued at 50. We couldn't do any more without um, steady and solid workers. Um, so it gave us the confidence that we would be able to expand our acreage, increase our production, transition to more advanced growing systems, which require a lot more management, and to high valued varieties. Um, and it really took away the stress of just not knowing how we were going to get all the work done. And I think advantages, whoops, sorry, advantages to the industry. Um, collectively, the apple growers, at least, and, and horticulture farmers as well, um, over the last 15 years, we've really been able to grow our industry and increase our production. And consequently, the packing houses have uh, had the uh, opportunity to expand their markets, both domestically and export. There's been a tremendous increase in investment in farm equipment and technology and the storage of apples and other fruits and vegetables and the packing capacity. There's been a lot of uh, big investment in that infrastructure. And I think the advantages for community are uh, it's an enhanced cultural diversity. We're a pretty homogeneous society here. Um, and there's a big increase to local business support, both from the farm and from the expenditures of the employees as they do buy things to take home. Um, so it's enhanced the economic activity. Um, similar to Janine from what they do at Cornwallis Farms, we uh, start we start every day with a quick coffee uh, and review of the day. But every Monday morning, we have a meeting where we discuss our plans for the week. And once we have the list, the employees, they have autonomy over what tasks they do when and who does what. So they've been here returning year after year. They know, you know when it's the best time to wiggle hoe and when it's the best time to put trellis up. And, and they really manage that within their week. And that makes them feel included and they understand they really understand that their work uh, makes the farm successful and not just us, but them as well. And, and we, we keep telling them that the success of this farm is not just for our family, it is for their families. And we all know, and they know that when the business does well, we all win. So they're invested in the success of the business. Um, what challenges have we had? Well, uh, the biggest one would be uh, misconceptions in the public. Um, you know, there's a lot of the public, unfortunately, that feel uh, it's cheap labor, that the foreign workers are taking jobs away from locals and that they are not treated well. But uh, I can tell you that the majority of farms uh, have great housing, have good relationships with their employees. Um, and I can tell you that the work that they do and the pay they receive goes home and supports large extended families. It's able to keep their children in school. Um, and any story you hear on the news that is a bad news story, that seems to be the one we all hear about. And it's often in one of the larger centers, perhaps Ontario or BC, where they're employing large numbers of workers, many more than 10 or 20 or 30, but up to 50 or 100 and 200. Um, and uh, I just, and it, and it hurts me to say this, but our, our people, our workers do just feel discriminated against and they do experience racism in the community. And uh, that's just, you know, a challenge that we have to live with um, and hopefully continue to do better by. Um, another challenge is language. I mean, the Mexican workers speak Spanish, you know, so you, you've got to get over that barrier. The Jamaicans have a, we employ all Jamaicans, so I know much more about them than the Mexicans, but um, they have their own way of communicating their own way of talking. So it's really important that when we communicate, that we communicate clearly, and then we ask back, have you really understood what we're saying so that there's no questions? Um, that's pretty important. And I just wanna see my other notes here. Um, yeah, and most farms, as I said, do work through this. And you know, we have to com communicate our instructions, our health and safety, our procedures, our manuals, our policies. So we're, we work through that. Um, and it's, a, it, it's really a fun learning experience. Uh, there's, there's also challenging uh, moments when, when you have a group of people, men, living together and working together side by side, and they didn't get to pick that roommate, you know, there's bound to be some conflict and that's human. And, uh, you know, how we deal with that is, is we just bring everything out into the open and we just 
our philosophy here is we must respect each other and respect our workplace. So um, if you don't necessarily like each other, we have to get along well, we have to live in harmony, we have to work in harmony, and we have to respect one another, but personal differences are just put aside. And we've had success just bringing that right up front. Um, education, skills, and training, I, this would be with any employee, but uh, it may be a little more challenging with some of the people that come here on the foreign worker program because they don't all have a grade 12 education, very smart and capable individuals, but might need a little help doing their first aid training or their pesticide training and uh, reviewing policies and contracts and manuals and that sort of thing, but um, very teachable. <clears throat> and an example I'll give you is um, driver's license. We have uh, four guys who've been coming back every year and I've been we've been saying we really want to get you your Nova Scotia license we'd rather you have that than your international license it works better for all of us and uh, they kind of avoided it you know I gave them the manuals like you do when you're 16 and and they was every year they just didn't feel comfortable well, that last year in quarantine when they were here I brought them each a manual I sent them links to practice tests online and I can't even tell you how elated they were when July came and they got their licenses. They passed their written tests, they passed their drivers, and they were so proud and so grateful for the encouragement. And it's great for us too, but they really felt accomplished. Uh, what are some other benefits to workers and employers uh, with this program? Um, as I said, the economy benefits. The economy benefits because farms are doing better and it's spending more money, but the workers, all of their money goes back into, they send some home each week, but they also buy household goods and dry goods to send home, electronics. So their money is going into the economy. And, and a benefit to the employees, I can say, is that they dental and medical care in Jamaica is very expensive. So because they're paying into an insurance program through their liaison, it's not our government, it's through their own insurance program, they're able to get any problem teeth or if you know we had a guy who had appendicitis and and I can tell you he was so grateful and really well cared for back home when he was when he would have gone to the hospital he would have been do, do I have enough money to pay for an x-ray or can I afford an ultrasound what do I do so the stress of those surprises was really taken away and, uh, you know, I'm a very emotional person, but I really feel that our corner of the world, our little corner here is enriched. Um, you know, we are integrated with people from another culture. We've learned their customs, their values, and their beliefs. And our kids and our grandkids are exposed to a, people of another race and another background. And, and I just think that makes us all richer. And uh, they, you know, the biggest benefit, of course, is that they help us be successful here and we help them be successful at home. And advice, um, what advice would I give somebody, you know, wanting, wondering about this? Um, how have we made it work? We, we trust our employees, we've trained them and we empower them. And we include them in our planning. We utilize their skills because many, all of them have jobs at home and they have different skills in construction or farming or driving or electrical. Um, and we involve them in uh, health and safety. We establish clear roles and responsibilities and we communicate often and clearly. And of course, we all respect one another. It's important amongst the workers that there be one of that crew that's kind of the leader and, and that kind of happened organically and that really works well. So we're not dealing with 10 people, we're dealing with one and then it goes from there. And how do, how do we retain them? I think we make their work rewarding and we show appreciation for their contribution. These guys are here missing every child's birthday you know, or maybe not everyone, but lots of birthdays, their own birthdays, their anniversaries, their kids' graduations. You know, if a family member is sick, sometimes they've missed funerals of close family members. They are making a huge sacrifice. Um, we also know their spouses' names and how many children they have. And we just, we just know, and, and that shows them that we care about them. Um, we provide quality work clothing. It's, it's just no fun to work all day in a pair of cheap work boots. If you have good gloves and good boots, then your people are going to work better for you. And of course, we offer cold treats on hot days and warm drinks on cold days. And we'll have staff lunches as Geneve does at their place. We recognize birthdays with the cake because they don't have anybody to go home to at night. So we are the people that are gonna sort of 
you know, give them that recognition and, and fuzzy warm feelings on a special occasion. And, you know, they have spots for vegetable gardens. And, and, and I want to say right now, too, that this is not just our farm that does these good things. Like most of the farms around here, they have that same kind of relationship because, because as I said, we are their closest family here in Canada. All of the rest of them, they only talk to by phone at night. Um, and what do we get out of it? Well, we get to run a successful farm business and we forge relationships with people from another country and we get to witness their culture, eat their food and expand our horizons. And it sounds cliche, but it's, it's true. Um, just a few pictures of some of the things we do here on the farm. We often have our breaks together. We think spending time together is uh, valuable and, uh, you know, coffee and tea and, uh, warm place to have a coffee break is appreciated. Uh, nice Jamaican home cooking. Our guys come into our kitchen a couple times a season. They cook us a meal. Whew. And I'm telling you, they know how to cook. Uh, so we share meals a few times a year. Obviously, we reciprocate and have meals with them and, and at our farm and, and many other farms that I know of as well. Thanksgiving is a particularly special time. It's peak harvest, but it's very special. And uh, the kids, the grandkids are usually around somewhere in the mix and a uh, surprise staff lunch can go a long way to building uh, trust and appreciation. And finally, I just want to introduce you to Leon who's been coming to our farm for 12 years. And uh, he has four children at home, three girls and a son. And we've been to their place and met them and we're so grateful for that. They, they put us up for a couple of nights in their home and uh, Wyla is our 12, well, she was, I think, 12 or 14 months there. She's a little older than that this year. But anyway, she's my youngest granddaughter, and the kids are often here. Um, and, they, and they're as comfortable with our Jamaican workers as they are with us. So I, I'm going to say that our farm is successful, our family is enriched, and the blessings are many. And I think this picture tells it all. And now I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Janice. So we're going to move on to our next presentation. We have Mary Jo McKay, who is the Manager of External Relations uh, with the Department of Labor, Skills and Immigration. And Mary Jo is going to talk about some programs that can help employers attract and employ new immigrants to Nova Scotia. So I'll turn it over to you, Mary Jo. Great. I'm just going to share my screen. So nice to hear all the comments already. Thanks, uh, Janet. Really appreciated comments you made. trying to get to my I'll just do it from this from this can you um can you see my screen yes can't seem to get rid of the top to be able to just do it full screen but that's fine so I'm um, I'm working with uh, the province so I'm with the Department of Labor Skills and Immigration and I'm in the Immigration and Population Growth Branch so we support employers who have labor needs and are looking to use immigration to bring people in permanently. It's a little bit different than the seasonal program. So I'll explain how those programs work. I hope I'll explain how those programs work. Okay, so um, our authority with the federal government and immigration is shared. Um, so under our constitution, we have a role in immigration just like all the other provinces do. And at the provincial level, we can nominate or endorse a candidate. So that means that we're making a recommendation to the federal government that our province needs this foreign national here, and they will be coming here to fill a labor need and bringing skills that are important to our economy. Um, that provincial approval is kind of like a big giant recommendation to the federal government that we need this person, but it's always the federal government, our colleagues in Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, who make the decision about who can uh, actually get into the country, be they coming temporarily like the seasonal agriculture workers, coming as a visitor, an international student, but also who's coming permanently to be a permanent resident of Canada. And our provincial programs always have permanent residency as the end goal. We wanna build the population. We want those foreign nationals to be coming with their spouses, with their children, you know, building our population and, and adding to our communities. There are no fees for an employer, no fees to employers to apply to our provincial nominee program or our Atlantic immigration program. 
but there would be fees if an employer was supporting a candidate to get a work permit. And there are always fees to the candidates to make their applications to federal immigration. How do you get people? Um, we heard a bit about the temporary options, um, accessing global talent. The temporary foreign worker program is a federal program. A piece of it is that seasonal agriculture worker program that's working so far so well for Janet. Um, there are other ways that the federal government um, can facilitate an individual to get a work permit. Um, they have things called international mobility program. There are other um, federal programs. Um, but essentially those temporary immigration programs support someone to come on a work permit, but that work permit has an end date. It has an expiry date. So when that, when that happens, that individual is expected to go home. And, and depending on the program, that may work totally fine. And for certain um, agriculture producers, that, that's just the nature of work. Um, but we have a lot of employers who reach out who have people who are here temporarily, who are working for them, and the employer does not want to lose them when um, their work permit expires. They want to keep them long term. And we have employers who want to recruit people directly from overseas and to keep them long term. So as far as that keeping them long term piece goes, often I'll be asked in my role, how does someone even become permanent anyway in the country? How does that happen? So we've got all of our temporary people, but how do people become permanent? Well, they're either going to be sponsored by a family member, a citizen, a permanent resident already living in the country. That family class, we hear about people sponsoring their spouse to become a permanent resident. That happens often. Um, they could be identified under the humanitarian class of immigration. So these would be the refugees who are selected to come to the country. And when they arrive, they're automatically a permanent resident of Canada. Um, other people who claim asylum in our country um, could potentially obtain their permanent residency through that humanitarian class. At the provincial level, we don't have any authority on picking or identifying candidates under the family class or the, or the humanitarian class. We get involved, every province in Canada gets involved under the economic class of immigration, the economic class of permanent immigration. So under the economic class, of course, the federal government has a whole bunch of programs that can support people to come to Canada because of their skills, because of the job offers that they have, um, the federal government has the Atlantic Immigration Program. It's a federal program. We administer a piece of it. I'll mention it in, later in the presentation. The federal government also has the Agri-Food Pilot, which is a relatively uh, new permanent residency program that's supporting um, individuals to come and get their permanent residency in the agriculture sector. And we have at the provincial level our Nova Scotia nominee program. So when I um, speak about both of those programs, um, I'm gonna be referring to something called skill levels and knocks. So really quickly, um, if, you're not, if you've never heard of the National Occupational Classification System, the NOC, um, it's used a lot in immigration, especially in permanent residency immigration. This is like a giant dictionary of jobs. My job has a skill level, it has a four digit code, it has duties identified, your job has a skill level. But as you see, skill levels are gonna be either considered high, so NOC zero A or B, could be considered intermediate, NOC C, or could be considered low skill. I like to refer to that as entry level, NOC D. But just thinking about the agriculture sector, um, there are definitely jobs in the agriculture sector in all of these skill levels. Um, the consultants, the managers, the supervisors, the livestock inspectors, the general farm worker, intermediate skilled, the harvesting labor would be more of the entry level positions that I think Janice spoke about. So depending on the job offer, the program um, that's available to you uh, is dependent upon that job offer. So just to speak to our two programs really high level, we have our Nova Scotia nominee program, it's got a whole bunch of sub-programs in it. You see nine on the screen. Um, we have programs to support people to use entrepreneurship to get their permanent residency. They might be buying a firm and using that entrepreneurship to support their permanent residency. Um, the ones I'm gonna speak about are really the job-based immigration streams of our Nova Scotia nominee program. We have this program through an agreement with our federal colleagues. 
we have a bit of autonomy to adjust it, change it as um, we see fit. It, we are always looking to see, does it make sense? Is it meeting labor needs? Um, so we're regularly looking at um, um, our nominee program and we've recently made some changes. But I'm really just gonna speak about the job-based streams. So unlike um, you know, seasonal agriculture where you know, the job is not full-time permanent, in order to support a candidate to come in um, and become a permanent resident and get a work permit en route to permanent residency. If you were using our nominee program, the job would have to be full-time permanent. Now, from an immigration perspective, that means 30 hours a week. Um, there can be some variability. We've made some changes to accept a little bit of variability on that, maybe a little bit less than 30 hours a week, um, depending on operational needs, but we would need to see that full-time permanent job offer. As you can see, any skill level, high skilled, intermediate skill, and even the entry level positions could be considered here. Um, in order to support the candidate to get their permanent residency under one of these streams, it's going to take a little bit of time for them to get their, to get their permanent residency decision. It can take up to 22, 24 months. But while they're waiting for that permanent residency decision, they have the option to be here on a temporary work permit. So they're on a temporary work permit, but they're working for the employer while their permanent residency application is being processed. So we call it a bit longer to get PR, but they're here temporarily while they're waiting and they're working. Candidates need to meet eligibility requirements. And sometimes when I talk to operators in your sector, um, this is the tricky part because you know people may be here temporarily doing a really great job and they may be coming back year after year after year. And they may satisfy your job requirement, be it NOC 0, A, B, C, or D, but they're going to have to also meet immigration requirements because these people are gaining permanent residency in this country. It's a big deal. So language uh, tests will be required. Minimum high school diploma will be required and candidates will need work experience. So we have a, a number of streams. I think in your sector, the skilled worker stream would be used and, and is being used by employers in your sector to bring in skilled workers at any skill level. Our newest uh, stream is occupations in demand and it looks at seven specific occupations. None are exactly agriculture, but um, truck drivers are in there and it make, it's a way to try to make the process a little bit easier. But with a job offer from a Nova Scotia employer that meets criteria, the candidate can apply for a nomination. They make the application to us at the province. If we approve it, then they enter the next step, which is their permanent residency application. They can identify their spouse, their children. And if they need a work permit, they can apply for a work permit as well. There is no labor market impact assessment required to get a work permit under our nominee program. It's not 100% guarantee that they're gonna get the work permit and permanent residency, but our conversion rates are very good. Just wanna note our other program, the Atlantic Immigration Program, it launched on January 1st of 2022, and it builds on the success of the previous Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program. This is also a job-based immigration program the job would have to be high skilled, knock zero A or B, but it could also be intermediate skilled, knock C. Um, employers do a lot of work in the Atlantic Immigration Program. It's an employer driven program. So employers first need to get approved by us. Employers are involved in making applications to us. Um, and employers need to take training. Um, they need to take onboarding training to introduce them to immigration. They take intercultural competency training as well at no cost to them, um, but to help create that culturally competent workforce that can help retain that foreign worker. Like our nominee program, the candidate arrives first on a work permit and are, is working while their permanent residency application is being processed. It's a three-step process. Employer first needs to get approved. It's called designation. You only do that once. Um, once you're designated, you can I enter the second step, which is endorsement. That's when you make a job offer to a candidate. They could already be working for you, or they could be overseas. The candidate gets a wonderful settlement plan done at no cost to them. 
employer completes training. If we improve endorsement, the candidate can apply for permanent residency and for a work permit. When they're on their work permit, their spouse can be with them, their children can be here, kids can go to school, they would have access to MSI. Um, and then when they get permanent residency, no need for a work permit anymore. I'll be the first to say that immigration is kind of complicated. Um, it's complicated at the temporary um, stage. It's also complicated in supporting permanent residency. There's tons of things to think about, and that's why my team exists to help employers through the process. So if you ever had any questions, you could just reach out to our employer support team. That's where I work. And um, we can talk about your candidate, your job offer, your situation, what might work. Maybe it is a temporary pathway, but maybe it's one of our permanent ones. So thank you for your um, attention and happy to join my colleagues in any questions and answer, question and answer period. Great. Thank you so much, Mary Jo, for outlining those for us. Um, I am going to open it up now for questions. So I do see a couple of questions in the chat. So I'll start with those. And I believe the first one um, was when Geneve was talking. So I think this is directed towards you, Geneve, um, from Caitlin Salzman. It said, you mentioned the wage increases each year. Can you talk a bit more about this, how you do it? Is it based on the number of years, uh, quality and skill? Does it max out? Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, we have a couple ways. First, we do an automatic cost of living each year for every employee. Um, and then we do one over time. So with a new employee, um, after two years, they would be entitled to a, a raise. And after four years, another raise. Um, and that's just based on time. Uh, so we do that up till 10 years. And other than that, the raises would be based on increase in responsibilities. Um, and those can continue after 10 years if they're taking on new responsibilities. Uh, we find with the ones that have been here longer, like uh, the 20 year employees, they've kind of reached their level for raises other than their cost of living. So with them, we do more a bonus program that will look at what they're uh, responsible for, whether it's in the poultry or the dairy, and if they meet certain production targets, uh, that will be rewarded with a bonus. Great, thank you, Janine. Um, so we have a question from the same person from Caitlin for Janice, and she's wondering, you know, how often you're doing these sort of warm treats, cold treats, staff lunches, just sort of, I guess, the, the staff appreciation things that you do. Well, that's very much uh, ad hoc, just kind of depends on the day, but we have a fridge here in the lunch room, and there's always popsicles in it, uh, and granola bars, that sort of thing. But no, um, quite often we'll have sort of a lunch celebration or you know, a big coffee break with cake or what have you, if we sort of, you know, put in a really rough week and we got the end of the trellis finished or something like that. But, and, and quite often when the grandkids are here, we'll just jump in the truck and take a bag of popsicles with us and go join them in the field. Uh, if it's raining, I, I, I try to always have warm coffee on um, so they can come and have the breaks inside instead of sitting in their tracks. Um, it's really, it really depends, you know, it's like it's like anything whenever you feel like having a popsicle or or you feel like you need a little boost of uh, happiness and you want to <laughs> celebrate something yeah like that great all right thank you i had a question for mary Jo. um just wondering what supports are available so if you have temporary foreign workers maybe through the sop program like uh, janice and larry do uh, what supports are available for them if they would like to become a permanent resident of nova scotia yeah, so I mean, I think the first tip I would give to an employer would be to really have a conversation with us about are they eligible? Um, and if they're not eligible, how do we get them eligible so the next time they come to Canada, maybe then they could be eligible? I mean, they have to meet program criteria. And as I mentioned often, um, I have had difficult conversations with employers who bring people up seasonally who really like them and they've been coming year after year and they really want their spouse to be here and their children to have that opportunity in Canada, but they don't have a high school diploma. So is there a way that they can be supported to be obtaining their GED? Um, often language can be the issue and it's not necessarily speaking, but it, from an immigration perspective, the standard's a bit higher and it's reading, writing, listening. Um, you have to have a certain level across. So to begin some of those training um, pieces now if they're not eligible. So it's a complicated process and that's why we're here. And I would, I would really say if you want to keep one of your seasonal agriculture workers and you think you have a full-time job, give us a call and we can talk about uh, program criteria. 
Great. Okay, thank you. Um, I had one other question, and I'm going to open it up to both Janice and Geneve. Um, just thinking about, you know, do you have one, I guess, one certain piece of advice that you would give to employers who are having difficulty finding workers um, for their operation and are considering either looking for, you know, local labor, Geneve, or thinking about um, accessing the temporary foreign worker program, Janice. So maybe Geneve, if you want to go first. And... Well, thank you. You know, I, I think keeping them and getting that good reputation helps you. And, and I will say, you know, we have advertised for employees before and found some. And unfortunately, a lot of them didn't stick around. So it seems like most of our long-term employees, we've gotten more by word of mouth that they've come to us or they've known someone that worked here or started as a summer student. So I think just having that culture of um, an extended family, as sort of Janice had said before, you know, I showed the, the picture when we had lunch when we were doing schedules. We'll also take them out for supper at the end of planting as a, as a thank you. And up until COVID at Christmas time, we always had an evening where all our employees and their spouses and children all came to our house for, for a meal. So it's, it's just those connections and, and being an extended family, as well as making sure you have that employer employee relationship because you do need those boundaries as well. Janice? Yeah, um, I think there's a few considerations. Number one, if you're if you're looking to hire foreign workers, then you obviously have to have the housing and the space to keep to, to, to put them and you know good water and all of that good stuff. So it takes a bit to uh, outfit a, a, an entirely entire house for a family that isn't yours. So it take that's a commitment for sure, and the maintenance that goes with it. Um, and I think be I think one of my pieces of advice would be check in and, and be, be connected to your employees. I think, you know, you, you see firms, sometimes they'll bring employees in and then here's your job and then just on your own all the rest of the time without any sort of guidance and, and um, understanding of where things are in the community. Um, little things like the food land and Zobies often bring in food that's manufactured in Jamaica, like their favorite little sticky buns and cinnamon breads. And I mean, that's really, that's really generous of the community that, so they're very supportive in that way. And I didn't mention that earlier, but um, yeah, be prepared to guide them. You know, where are the best places to go shopping? You know, um, where are the deals going to be in town and just be there so that they're just not hanging loose. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Janice. And, and I'm always sorry, just I'm just going to add if anybody ever wants to talk to me about, uh, you know, our experience or navigate ways, I'm, I'm always happy to talk. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Mary Jo, there was one more question. Um, it's Patricia, actually, under Caitlin's name. She's wondering, do you have any uh, experience with companies who are offering services to employees to help them? Are they legitimate? So I guess it probably depend on the company. But do you have any comments on that? Um, services to employers? Yeah, so it'd be companies who are offering services to employees to help them navigate the immigration process, I guess. Yeah, I mean, normally in some of the longer presentations, I do have a whole session on uh, representatives and licensed and recruiters. And I'm glad this question came up. So there are people who are registered immigration consultants. They have to be registered immigration consultants. There's a registry um, in order to provide advice to foreign nationals on immigration. Um, there are definitely people who are claiming uh, to be registered immigration consultants and are charging people money to give them bad advice or even potentially good advice, but they're not allowed to do it. But I want to, um, for employers, we, we know that a lot of employers in this sector, in other sectors, are being contacted by people who can say to you things like, I can find you a whole bunch of workers, not going to cost you anything. You just need to sign this contract with me. Well, that sounds probably a little bit too good to be true. And if it does, it is. Um, in order to recruit foreign nationals for a employer in Nova Scotia, the recruiter needs to be licensed. So you can imagine there are loads of people around the world who are desperate not to be where they are. And there are loads of unscrupulous people who will take advantage of that desperation. And it's not unheard of to hear that a foreign national has paid $100,000 for a job offer in Canada to support their immigration. You don't wanna get involved in that. If anyone um, does offer you the services of recruitment, make sure they're licensed by our department 
And anyone offering um, immigration services, really, they have to be registered. If you get involved in this, that could really impact your ability to use immigration in the future, both temporary programs or permanent programs. Hey, good advice, Mary Jo. So always check. Um, I did notice there was one other question there uh, regarding looking at uh, SOP employees and getting MSI. So I can address that one. So that is one that, you know, it has been an issue and continues to be an issue. And I know um, the Federation and the various uh, like Ford Association of Fruit Growers have definitely been lobbying. And this would be for Department of Health because they make the decisions on the MSI. So um, it, it's a question we've heard. And, and I just wanted to say we do hear you. And that's something that, you know, is, is constantly being discussed. So at this point, no, um, there is not MSI insurance for SOP uh, employees. Um, um, but it is something that does continue to be discussed. Can I can I jump in on that one quickly, sure. Rachel? So um, it's my understanding that if a candidate has a temporary work permit that's a year long or longer, um, yes. then they would be eligible for um, MSI. You know, even some of our people are coming in permanently and only have an eight month work permit, and we're we're fighting because we we know it should be one year and. Um, they need that one year. I think it's one year less yeah. two weeks, something like that. Um, and if it's very temporary, the four months, six months, then MSI is kind of off the table right now. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we're getting close on time here. So I'm just gonna shift gears a little bit. We're keeping all of our panelists here. So if we do have any time left at the end and you have a burning question, or if you wanna write it in the chat and if our panelists are monitoring the chat, they can actually reply in the chat as well. So, but I'm just gonna, uh, put up my screen now. I have a quick presentation and I'm just going to give some of the highlights on uh, where we're going for this year for guidance for temporary foreign workers. All right, so that came up. All right. So as you may be aware, so last week you would have gotten an email from Perenia on with the guidance documents. So we've had lots of changes and changes midstream through the year, you know, right before the season started for the last two years, you know, up until two years ago, I, you know, really, you know, we knew about the temporary foreign worker program, but it wasn't something that we were involved with um, really closely. Um, but with the arrival of COVID, of course, and lots of restrictions, there's been many, many changes. So, um, you know, we are happy to see that this year seems to be getting a little bit back towards normal and I'm knocking wood as I say that, but you know, we are starting to see, you know, some, some changes because of the high vaccination rate and things like that. So we are happy to say that Nova Scotia Health doesn't have any additional requirements this year above and beyond what the federal rules are for international travelers. And those rules are for all international travelers, anyone coming in from any international country, um, not just temporary foreign workers. So if we went away for spring break and went somewhere south for a few weeks and came back, we actually have to follow the same rules uh, coming back into Canada as well. So in 2021, we did have, um, you know, because the province had additional requirements, they did cover the cost of isolation due to those additional requirements. Uh, but this year, because there are no additional requirements from the province, it's just the federal guidelines. Uh, if there is isolation required or quarantine required, it will be the responsibility of the employer to cover the cost for this year. So I really can't emphasize enough. Um, it's important to go online and make sure you're reading through what those regulations are and what the rules are, because as everyone knows, they change fairly frequently. We do get updates on when they change. So there was a few changes February 28th. There's more changes coming April 1st, um, but all of the most up-to-date documents will be found online. And I mean, if you don't have time to write down this URL, even if you just Google, you know, federal international travelers coming into Canada, it'll bring you to the page and you can find all the latest uh, information. So I'm just gonna highlight some of the things. I'm not gonna go through every rule that's in that, um, but you know, obviously the big one that has the most impact for us is that that 14 day quarantine period that everyone had to do last year. This year is only required for those that are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated. So if they're not fully vaccinated, and that also includes those that are vaccinated with vaccines that are not recognized by the Public Health Agency of Canada. So those would be the WHO approved vaccines. So uh, there are a few countries that use vaccines that are outside of that realm. So if they do have those ones, um, they would be considered unvaccinated when they arrive in Canada and as such would have to quarantine. Uh, and also any fully vaccinated um, workers who arrive but are displaying symptoms of COVID whenever they're coming through uh, CBSA. So if they have a cold, uh, a fever. So sometimes if they have someone coming through that's displaying symptoms of COVID, they would also be told to quarantine. Um, 
And then also you have to make sure that every, all of your fully vaccinated workers have their vaccine records uploaded properly into the Arrive Can app, because that's how they're going to make that decision, whether or not that person is fully vaccinated or not. So you may have someone that is fully vaccinated, but maybe didn't upload the records into Arrive Can. Uh, and CBSA is not aware that they're vaccinated. So therefore they're gonna get put into that, you know, the line that says you have to quarantine when you arrive. So it's really important um, that you're having those conversations, especially for returning workers, um, as they come in to make sure that everything is in place before they get to Canada, because that decision really is made as they come through that lineup with CBSA when they arrive in Canada at their point of arrival. And any workers that are coming in that have to quarantine this year, so anyone that's not vaccinated or has been told for whatever reason that they need to quarantine when they arrive in Canada, um, they do have to complete that day eight switch health test. So they, they would get a test on arrival and then they're gonna get a take home kit. So you know, remember last year they had those take home kits um, it was very large volume of people doing those. It, it tended to be a bit problematic. So our public health was really gracious and stepped in and, and did a, a day 12 public health test here in the province. Um, but because we expect these numbers to be much, much lower this year, uh, and we're only following those federal guidelines, the feds require that day eight test. So just to remind you that if you have folks that are in quarantine, remind them that they need to do that day eight test. And then there's also other things they need to do. They need to follow, you know, check in on the can Arrive Can app every day, do their health updates, do all of those things as well. Um, fully vaccinated workers. So there is some random testing, COVID testing when they arrive in Canada. Not everybody's tested, but they do randomly pull people out of the line to get tested. And up until February 28th, if you were randomly tested, you had to quarantine until you got those results back. Uh, now that requirement has been waived. So they, they can come even if they're tested and have that day one test, they can come uh, go to their um, place where they're of residence and then start work the next day. Um, but we do ask that everyone, you know, if you're bringing in a number of workers to set up those corporate accounts with Switch Health, uh, so you can monitor, you'll know exactly who was tested. You can go in and check to see when their results are available just to make sure. Um, so that's a really good uh, thing you can do in advance of your workers arriving and uh, they can start working as normal. However, because you know they have arrived from an international country and everyone coming in internationally does have other rules they have to follow. It's not just sort of, they arrive, they don't have to quarantine and it's, and it's business as usual. So there are some rules, federal rules that need to be followed um, for the first 14 days after arrival into Canada. And again, this is the same for anyone coming into Canada. So if there happens to be a positive, say on that day one test, if they were pulled aside, got a random test, if they happen to test positive, they have to quarantine for 10 days. So you'll notice in the province now, Nova Scotia is saying, if you test positive, you have to quarantine for seven days. While they're in that first 14 day period of arriving in Canada, if they test positive at any time during those 14 days, they're under the federal rules, which is a 10 day quarantine. They have to wear a mask in public places. So you may have noticed, you know, restrictions dropped here in Nova Scotia on the 21st. Um, but anyone that has come in for the, again, for that first two week period, if they're out in public places, they do have to wear a mask. Um, any travel companions who may have arrived and um, there was a positive case with their sort of travel cohort on your farm, then those individuals are actually required to isolate as well. So they have to isolate for an additional 14 days. So a full two weeks after they had the last contact with that positive case. Um, so just some things to be aware of. Um, and then any positive cases, you have to report those. There's a number on the form. You report that to the Public Health Agency of Canada. So when your worker arrives and gets through the lineup at CBSA, they're going to be given a handout, whether based on whether or not they are um, told to quarantine or, or exempt from quarantine. So the first one, and it, I've shown it there, it's kind of hard to see, the color doesn't show up as well on the screen, but it's a teal color and there's teal colored bars. So that is the vaccine, the handout that's given to fully vaccinated travelers. So it goes through all of the requirements that they have to do. So again, you know, they need to monitor their symptoms for two weeks. They need to wear that mask. They need to um, you know, make sure that they're <clears throat> maintaining a list of their contacts just in case they test positive so they can let people know. Um, and then it tells you what to do if they do happen to test positive. And this can be found on the website. So if you go online, again, if even if you just Google international travelers arrival in Canada, it'll bring up these spread, these sheets. So I would encourage uh, all employers to copy and make a copy of those. So you, you're well aware of what the expectations are for that first two week period. And then the second one is if your employee is not vaccinated or partially vaccinated or was told to quarantine, they're going to get this one. It's a bit harder to see on the screen there, but it's, it's more of a dark green color. Um, 
So if they get the dark green handout, you know, they're meant to quarantine and it just goes through what that means. So they're quarantined, they need to take their COVID-19 tests as directed. So to do that day eight test, uh, make sure that's sent in and then obviously reporting every day and checking in on that Arrive Can app um, while, they're, while they're in quarantine. Now, if they are unvaccinated coming in, unlike last year where we required single hotel rooms um, for isolation, they can uh, have a congregate setting. So you can have the same, pe same group of people if they arrived on the same flight, the same travel cohorts together, they can isolate together. But again, they have to have social distancing and wearing masks and making sure there's, you know, um, not having too close a contact while they're there, but they are allowed to, to quarantine in the same house. So some important points to remember for this year, and again, those were just sort of the highlights of what those documents say. So I would encourage everyone to go and, and print those off. So for folks that are coming in, you know, vaccines, the province is still continuing to support first, second and booster doses um, of vaccines for temporary foreign workers. Again, because of the MSI issue, you can't book online. You need to phone that one eight three three number um, to book an appointment, or you can watch for public health mobile drop-in clinics. So they do walk-in clinics all across the province. They kind of rotate around, uh, but you don't need an appointment for those and they can utilize those clinics. You can drop in if they wanted to get a booster shot or um, if it's someone that was unvaccinated arriving and needed a first or a second dose, um, they can definitely, and we would encourage them to get vaccinated while they're here. Uh, if you happen to have a large number of workers arriving and, and you know, say they, none of them had a booster dose and they would like a booster dose um, and, you know, you're having trouble to try and get them booked, um, just give me a call, reach out, we can discuss options. You know, I can talk to public health to see, I know they did some reach out clinics last year for this group. Um, I'm not making any promises that they will again this year, but definitely reach out and let me know and we can, uh, we can see what we can do to at least facilitate the ask. Testing. Um, so testing for any symptomatic workers or close contacts, and this is for any time throughout the growing season or the season that they're here, um, can be arranged through Nova Scotia Public Health. So basically you go online, follow the little checklist of, you know, whether or not you qualify for a PCR test or to pick up um, rapid tests and follow those testing guidelines. So that's um, just sort of standard procedure, what we would do if we had symptoms or, or uh, were a close contact. And then one thing I wanted to mention was the travel test. So last year we did offer, or public health offered travel testing for exit tests for folks that required uh, a negative PCR test before they were able to travel home. Um, public health decided to facilitate this because at the time when folks started leaving back in you know, August, September, even early October, there was two companies in the province that offered this testing. They were in Halifax. It was difficult to get appointments. Since that time, because now the world has opened up again and people are traveling a lot, there are travel test um, options available all throughout the province. Many pharmacies are doing travel tests, as well as some of those companies have opened up um, offices across the province, not just in Halifax. So they are, um, we are requiring that if people do need, and we don't even know at this point what's going to be happening and what's going to be required by other countries, because as everyone knows, Canada is dropping that requirement as of April 1st, you don't have to have a negative test before you come to Canada. So we expect other countries may do the same. We don't know, but if exit tests are required, um, there are a list and we can help um, get you the list of who is doing that testing and you can make an appointment for them to get that testing. But public, uh, public health is no longer offering that travel um, take home test that they did last year. So for other information, um, Perennia is still going to be available to assist employers in finding offsite accommodations. So if you can't manage a uh, quarantine of an individual on farm, so you have, you know, housing, but you have people in all your houses, but you have one worker coming in that's uh, not vaccinated and needs to quarantine, obviously it's going to be difficult to find a spot for them. Um, so you can contact Perennia and they can uh, assist you with some of the uh, isolation hotels that we used in the past. Um, Perennia will be tracking arrivals into Nova Scotia, so if you're bringing in workers outside of the farms organization, um, let them know and when they're coming in the number of, uh, of arrivals and they have some information that they would like to collect. And I also continue to meet with the Atlantic Federal Provincial um, Working Group here in, uh, once a week. So if any issues arise, please let me know. I can bring them forward. We, there's representatives from Service Canada, Public Health Agency of Canada, and CBSA on those calls. So if there are things that come up through the season or even before the season that you need clarity on, just you know, shoot me an email or give me a call and I'm more than happy to bring that up at those meetings. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I see there's a few more questions popping in.
So it's from Tammy. Do I need to register all of my workers before they arrive? And I assume that means for Switch Health, uh, I expect, or is that for with Perennia? Anyway, Tammy, you can give me a call afterwards. If it's Switch Health, yes, you need to do it before they arrive because we don't know who may be pulled out of the line for random testing. Um, so basically before their, before their flights, make sure that they're registered with Switch Health. Um, if it's with Perennia, just to let them know who's coming. If you're using farms, which I believe you do, we do get the lists from farms, um, but maybe you can check in with Perennia just to make sure that they've gotten that. And then another one, um, do our TFWs need a negative test if arriving in Canada after April 1st? So no, as of April 1st, they have, uh, the federal government has waived that requirement for a negative test before they come in. Um, so at this point, um, it's our understanding that as of April 1st, they no longer need to do that test before they come. And hotel availability is limited for April 1st. I have a secondary set of workers arriving and I have workers who arrived on February 28th who are already on site. I'm not sure what the question is there, Danielle, but if you wanna give me a shout after the, after the webinar, I'm more than happy to kind of chat with you about that. So I think we're getting close on time here, folks. I'm not sure I wanna open up to my panelists again, just for a quick minute, if anyone has any parting remarks that they'd like to make, um, no, no pressure, but if there's something you forgot to mention that you'd like to, we can, I think, I think maybe we're good. So I'd like to thank everyone um, very much for your time uh, this afternoon. Uh, we really appreciated hearing and it was uh, great to see the slideshows and, and to, realize what you know great farm operations we have here in the province uh, for for employers and and uh, for our employees I think it's uh, you know really uh, I, I just really enjoyed both of your presentations and Mary Jo definitely great to hear if you know if we have workers and or if we want to bring people in longer term and how they might go about that so thank you very much everyone for all of your time uh, and thank you everyone for attending the workshop this afternoon <laughs>